The views and opinions of this program are those of the host, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions bored of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. Well, as we take a look at Monday's trade action, what happened in the grain and oil seeds? We were doing okay there for a while, and then we just kind of fell out of bed as we got to the close with soybeans, Chicago wheat, leaders to the downside. We have plenty to take a look at. Joining us now, our good friend John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing is on the show. John, hope you had a good weekend. Um, yeah, I guess that's my first question. That's where I want to start. We kind of fell out of bed compared to where we were throughout much of the day on Monday. So any any indication exactly what we saw here? Pretty much a grain, oil seeds just across the board, John? Well, let's go to the wheat market first. That seems to be the leader to the downside again. I continue to see them manage money, push that wheat market lower. It just, just can't seem to get any footing, whether it's Ukraine deal off, Ukraine deal on, that type of thing. Now, we have, to me, we actually had some friendlier tones in terms of some of the overnight weather or the forecast over the weekend you know did we get a frost event looks like we had some significant time for some of those winter wheat acres and freezing temperatures over the weekend so we'll have to look at the ratings today and see how they come out you know but right now the the funds just want to push this wheat market lower just given global supplies and the lack of competition that the united states has it just feels like that's the easy play here is to continue to sell wheat you know, then you go to the other two grains, corn and beans. Obviously, we got that news from the corn market today about that Chinese cancellation of old crop supplies. You know, obviously, last week we were buzzing about, you know, imports of Brazilian beans, which USDA has some figured in already. But it's just the market structure right now. We're watching South American prices significantly cheaper, continuing to trend lower. And that just makes it very, very difficult for us to muster any rallies here in the short term. Actually, I thought the corn market performed fairly well, given the negative news today from that Chinese cancellation of old crop bushels. But I think just that lack of buying strength in the wheat market just wouldn't allow the corn market to recover. Well, uh, a few things to unpack there. Let's stay on the wheat market. Um, I, I know some different varying notes. So we got a little bit of a reduction in Russia's wheat crop size from an agency as we got into Monday's trade. I know funds uh, looks like they're they're holding a pretty sizable short position here, especially in Chicago wheat, and it looks like they sold more on the day on Monday. And you know we've kind of thought that wheat. It's a bit of a leader, you know, in terms of this grain market, either up or down. Uh, man, you know, I, I know we've been overpriced compared to the world, but look at some of where these some of these levels are getting in this wheat market. I don't know. Is there cost for concern here, John? You know, again, we're re-breaking into some lows on some of these contracts, and that just kind of keeps that downward path in place. And, you know, that is concerning. It's just going to be hard when you look at the global supply, global price pictures, where we are in terms of all these grains, if you got one that's kind of the leader to the downside here, and then it pulls in corn because it's a competitive grain. So it, it just... It's just a very difficult market right now. And it's not just U.S. wheat. The funds are also sitting short the European wheat complex as well. There's just this anticipation that wheat supplies are fine. The demand is not there globally, which realistically, with the exception of China and their stockpiles, exporter totals are pretty doggone thin here for a multi-year low. So it's still a market in my mind. And I'm not sure what's going to be the trigger, but if we get one and these funds realize they're on the wrong side of the equation here, that they could be, the things could move very quickly, you know, so keep some optimism in the wheat market. But right now the path of least resistance or the easy thing to do is to hit the sell button. Well, I think another thing too, weather, I know some forecasts say, oh, we're going to get some more rain potentially in dry parts of the Southern Plains. But I think you got to look at it from a, a perspective of what can that rain really do? This crop severely damaged. We have planting delays, of course, with spring wheat across the north. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I wonder how much that argument about rainfall coming into the Southern Plains really 
can help this market. I just don't see it happening, John. I mean, anything in perception sometimes comes into play, but I agree with you. You're looking at the today expected 26% poor to very poor. You know, we'll see if that actually comes into play. Again, like we, we talk, mentioned quickly early, we did have some freezing temperatures come down into Harbor and Winter Week Country. You know, how, what's the damage there on a crop that's already struggling? Yeah, is it going to be too little too late? But, you know, if, again, the perception is some moisture is coming. So that seems to be what the market looks on, maybe what the market's trading on. It's, I think it's going to take some actual feed, field trials, samples, getting out there, seeing some, you know, actual results. I mean, maybe before this market realizes that there's an issue in that wheat crop, you know, and again, you still got to understand the U.S. is a very small percentage of the global wheat supply. So even though we have issues, there's still plenty of supplies available to the market at cheaper prices. And that just makes it very, very difficult for us to rally. Well, looking at these markets, I'll, I'll segue to corn as we were kind of tying corn in with wheat here a little bit. Uh, across all the grains, we saw some intermarket spread action on Monday, corn especially. And I have to think that old crop cancellation by China played into the pressure in the uh, May contract, July contract. But then you look at December. I know Friday we broke down below that 550 support area, but finishing 547 and a half on Monday, uh, I would consider that a win uh, just with the general money flow action that we saw on Monday, John. Yeah, a lot of spread action here lately. Obviously, that May July spread has been highly talked about and how big it's, how wide it's trending. Finally, saw a little correction in that today. Then you got the old crop, new crop spreads in terms of how they've been pushing out. You know, that's been supported by the tighter supply picture, the good cash market that's out there for the most part. Maybe we're seeing some wrinkles in that. Obviously, last week we saw the hard sell off. I think options expiration was a part of that, as well as, you know, this Chinese cancellation. Sometimes it takes a couple of days before it actually gets to the news wires, but the market knows. So I think that was coming into play. So when you see spreads unwind, that just tells us maybe there's some demand concerns on the front end. Again, we're still dealing with some market structure here. That July price compared to May being held in check because of that cheaper South American supply and some of that earlier Brazilian corn that's going to get harvested in that window. And again, it's just going to be hard for us to compete there with those bushels coming online and keeping the cash market in South America at a lower discount. You know, that's probably the reason we saw the cancellation today by China. They can step away from U.S. bushels. They picked up at a higher level, move them to a Brazilian, you know, origin and probably wind up saving themselves some, you know, some money in terms of price. You know, so that's still going to be a factor in here. Now, with that being said, you know, I have to kind of watch the next couple of weeks. We usually we typically see some strength moving into that May report. We'll have to kind of keep an eye on that window. I think another factor that's coming into play, though, that's not helping the old crop. Some of the river conditions in the Mississippi, you know, seeing those high water pictures. How's that doing with barge traffic? Again, maybe backing up some movement in terms of the bushels down to the Gulf, to the ports. You know, all those things are coming in here at this time window. But again, like I said, next few weeks could be kind of interesting as we get ready for that May report, uh, which typically the last couple of years has been of a swing price, unfortunately, to the downside for corn. Well, and with corn and with beans, too, on the new crop side, you know, that 550 level corn and then that 1275 levels, kind of what I'm watching now in, in beans. I feel like if we could hold around those marks, that would be... I, I'm not going to say bullish to the market, but I would say at least would be friendly and supportive to these markets here in this window, John. Yeah, I'm kind of with you in that regard. Being still like I like got a chance, we go back and poke at that March low, another 25 cents down. You know, the momentum on the bean market side is just not very good right now. You know, we're corn. Obviously, we're going to watch the planting pace numbers today. We'll see how things are. Obviously, I think we'll see some good movement on the on the eastern side of the corn belt. Western side, obviously, not going to get a whole lot done. Northern tier, nothing probably in that regard. You know, so we'll have to see how the market handles the planting pace numbers today. Now, Again, planning pace, any type of market rally comes off of that. Usually, typically, are opportunities to sell just because of, with our technology, we can get it to the ground in a pretty big hurry if the weather were to straighten out. It's too early to talk prevent plan. It's only April, you know, so we got some time until that becomes kind of a focus point in the marketplace overall. You know, but again, to talk about that 550 level, that was kind of a key spot. We're still holding above the, the you know, the March low a little bit here today, so yeah, it's just a kind of a scary window here. And, 
and to me, hopefully we can find some correction going into that May report. Then we got to sit back and see what those numbers are going to be. Because when you put the acre number, the trend line yield number, we'll see what the USDA does with demand. We could have a pretty high carryout number for that 23 marketing year for our first look at that December corn. Scary window here. So again, like we always talk about, don't get complacent even during a busy time of year. Know your break evens and and just make sure you're on top of things. Again, don't don't be complacent in a market like this, right, John? Correct. And you know, even if we're not at levels that are your break evens or in that regard, because of some of the input costs, you know, I would rather manage where you are versus watching things go even further, widening those margins out as well. So don't forget about being on the defensive. You know, rather be wrong with defense, leave the upsides open. Again, price flexibility is still gonna be a key. You know, supplies are still tight. Okay, 200 million bushels of beans, 1.3 million bushel on the, a billion bushel on the corn side. You know, the old crops market still going to be looking for supplies. You know, we get past this next few weeks here. We get kind of through the South American bean harvest or down to 90 percent harvested. It sounds like, you know, maybe this is a window where also the market sits back and goes, you know, hey, we're still a lot of beans. You know, we got a strong crush market here in the U.S. and they're going to be looking for supplies that's not here. We're having a conversation today with John Heinberg of Total Farm Marketing. John, I want to give us ample time to talk the protein sector. Let's look at cattle. And Friday afternoon, we had that cattle on feed report. Some folks in the trade considered it a bit of a bearish surprise, considering uh, the numbers uh, came in above the pre-report estimates. Now, I believe all the numbers were still lower than a year ago. Um, so I guess my question to you is uh, cattle market, Feeders under pressure, live cattle recovered some on Monday. Exactly how bearish was this cattle on feed report? What do you think, John? You know, I got to look at the cattle on feed numbers. Obviously, again, a little heavy to expectations. Let's focus on the live cattle side. Okay, at 96% or, you know, where we were compared to last year, that's still 4% less on the market than a year that was probably a couple percent less on that year. So we're looking at cattle numbers still at multi-year lows in this window. We've had a cash market that's been relatively aggressive, did fade a little bit last week. Some of that may have been some early trigger selling before the report in that regard. You know, we got guys pulling cattle forward. You know, a big number that we kind of look at too is the number of cattle on feed to 120 day level. You know, that, that's sitting down to almost 2.75% from last year. So the cattle numbers are still tight and the market actually behaved kind of like I thought it would today. You got the gut reaction sell off from the, you know, from some of the spec traders or the computer traders off the, the miss and the numbers. But then as we start thinking about things, the cash market's still going to drive this. We got cash still trading in the 175 handle. June still trading at 164, still looks relatively cheap. We got April getting close to expiration. That June month's going to lead over. Still got $300 plus carcasses out there. Retail values were firmer again today. I'm expecting cash trade to probably be steady to maybe even a tick higher again this week. And if that's the case, then this cattle market may have found a turning point and can get a little bit of a lift again. I'm not saying we're off and running on our way to $200 cattle, but I think we can stay in here fairly well supported given the fundamentals. Now, the biggest thing mm -hmm. we got to keep an eye on around that mid-May window, that's that time frame, maybe we see our retail demand peak out a little bit as the retailers have locked in their Memorial Day, Father's Day you know, supplies, and then we see the market could set back if we start seeing retail values soften. So we're at a little bit of a swing point here where I think a good run higher might be a great window to build some more opportunity to build the floor underneath the market. Just kind of thinking that maybe we got our late spring kind of high in place. And then we'll have to see where things want to go into the summertime window as we get past some of this this early spring demand. Well, I still think, too, uh, with this market as a whole, just that this cash market is our leader, uh, regardless of what we're really looking at. I mean, you still hear the feedlot sales. We're getting in getting some lofty levels here in the north, especially I just I continue to follow cash, honestly, John, as my cue to see what's happening in this cattle market as of late. And that's what's going to be the driver here. And you're hearing those cash prices, you know, yeah, they're for the next week or the spot week. But some of these are going out, you know, a week or two into May where they're still holding that good value. So, again, that just tells me cattle numbers aren't there right now in the feedlot. And at this time frame, the Packers are still still got some meat on the bone. You know, if they're throwing out a $300 you know, dollar choice carcass, there's still some profit level there. They can continue to bid into the cash market and look for those supplies. 
So I don't sense anything falling out of bed here other than maybe a technical break or something on the outside that causes some panic into the market. You know, obviously keep an eye on inflation data and things of that nature, you know, because that still comes into play when we need to see things roll over. That was some of the trigger for last week's sell off was that European inflation data being higher than anticipated out of Great Britain. And that just sent the market cautious because if the consumer can't afford to buy the beef, they won't buy the, the, the demand falls apart. But it seems like they're staying in there pretty well at this time frame. We didn't touch on feeders. You know, obviously feeder placements yeah. were a little high. That was probably about the most negative number in that marketplace. But again, we still got about 40% of those, those cattle on feed right now are heifers. And those are we start pulling on the any animals for the breeding stock side of things. It can be an interesting picture in terms of the feeder supplies as we go later into the year. So again, negative, but still got some long-term fundamentals that are supportive in that market as well. Well, John, how about over in the hog market? I smell some short covering in the hog trade. What are you thinking there? Two good days in a row uh, of the hog market trade. Solid day today. I'll take another day higher, especially as once as that market got has been getting beat up here over the last month or two. And you know, now what am I watching? What's the biggest thing? What's going on in the retail sector? Even though we're a little softer at midday today, we got carcasses back above the $80 handle. So again, that just helps out, provides a little bit more meat on the bone for the packer, maybe to get a little bit of cash movement. And you'll go in here. Now we still got a big premium to the index. That continues to be a concern when we're talking some of these deferred contracts. Like I say, we're going to be off and running with a V-bottom type move here, but at least we're seeing some money flow with the fund sitting over 26,000 short contracts. They got a lot of room to push this thing if they want to just get out of their shorts here and get this some, get some value back in this market. But, you know, even today we had a good solid rally, pushed a little couple bucks higher. Next thing you know, you could just see it starting to fade. It was just sitting there like, oh, no, here it goes again. Hang on, hogs. At least the buyers step back in at the, you know, towards the end of the day to get us back to a triple digit win in that, that June contract. So I don't think it's, I think it's going to be a rocky ride. I think maybe our bottom might be here as long as the fundamentals can start turning a little bit higher. How about that dairy trade, John? What are you seeing there as we get into the new week? You know, now that hogs are kind of maybe out of the woods a little bit, the dairy market looks like our kind of our ugly picture here. We got cheese prices dropping seven cents on barrel blocks today, and now we break to new lows in the front end. Again, supplies are heavy. Milk production and cow numbers are continuing to climb. Again, we're watching the cheese demand that's still kind of struggling right now. And realistically, I don't have a whole lot of good news for the dairy producer, at least that, that market still looks like it's right back on its slippery slope here with the price moves today. Well, John, always great insight, and we appreciate the time. Before we let you go, anything else you want to mention or reiterate to folks today? You know, watch this window here between now and the May report. I'd be kind of a defender of any strength that we get. If you get some old crop bushels, you know, make sure you're moving those through this area. I know you're going to be busy in the fields, hopefully. You know, but again, don't fall asleep here on the strength because things don't look really good in the, over the last couple of years after the May report. So I'm kind of watching some of those seasonal windows, at least that maybe we can get a bit of a bid into that. Last year after the May report, July corn lost 90 cents. 2021, it lost $1.30 in a very short time window after that May report. So kind of keep that on your radar going forward. You know, if the cash basis starts falling apart, that means this market's getting comfortable with corn supplies, and that's going to come into play in the futures market. Well, John, if folks want to reach out to you and get some advice uh, there at Total Farm Marketing, what is the best way to do that? Love chat with the main time. Give me a call, 800-334-9779. Shoot me an email, John H. at TotalFarmMarketing.com. And don't forget that website of ours, TotalFarmMarketing.com. John, always appreciate it, my friend. Have a great week, and we will talk to you next week. Sounds good. Have a great week. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing joining us today. That's going to do it for today's program. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.